Hey everyone, in today's video, I'm going to be responding to Pastor John MacArthur. He is a very popular uh, Reformed or Calvinist Protestant uh, pastor and theologian. Uh, he was on the Ben Shapiro show not too long ago. I wrote an article even about that, critiquing some of his uh, incorrect views about Catholic history. You can check that out at catholic.com. But today I want to respond to a video that I saw on YouTube. I think it's called Catholicism Exposed. Uh, but it's MacArthur being interviewed by someone, and he's putting forward a lot of different arguments against the Catholic faith, so I thought that I would respond to them. So, without further ado, here is my response to Pastor John MacArthur on the Catholic faith. Now, the question is, does church history support the Roman Catholic Church? Well, I think the appropriate answer to that is Roman Catholic Church history supports the Roman Catholic Church. Um, obviously, they have their own history. But to say that all of the history of the Church unanimously comes behind Rome is not true. No one is saying the Church Fathers articulated doctrine in the same way the post-Vatican II Church articulates doctrine. But a better question to ask is this. What current Church would the Fathers more clearly recognize as being analogous to the Church of their own time? And hands down, Catholicism is going to win over Calvinism in a second. For example, the doctrine that a Christian can never lose his salvation was unknown in the Church until the 16th century. According to Protestant author John Jefferson Davis, Calvin has greater confidence than Luther and the Catholic tradition before him that the believer can also have great assurance of his election and final perseverance. Uh, I think you can show in the Church Fathers that there was a clear understanding of justification by grace through faith alone. I think you can show in the Fathers that there was no commitment, say, to the papacy, there was no commitment to Mary, to various things that the, that, that the Church does in the Mass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's an audacious claim, and I would say just read the Fathers for yourself to see if it's true. I cover the Church Fathers a lot in my book, The Case for Catholicism, but another great resource that shows where the Church Fathers line up with Catholic doctrine is my friend Jimmy Aiken's book, The Fathers Know Best. So, no, it, it, you can't say that the, the Roman Catholic system is universally supported by the history of the Church. Furthermore, throughout the, the years of the Roman Catholic monolith in the Western world, there were always dissenters. There were always those who uh, upheld the true faith, whether you were talking about uh, Waldensians or Anabaptists or Huguenots or whatever it was. There were always those groups who really were the remnant of those who held to the true New Testament gospel. MacArthur seems to be endorsing a doctrine called Baptist successionism. This is the view that Baptists can trace their church all the way back to Christ, and the groups the church labeled as heretics throughout history, like the Cathars, the Waldensians, the Paulicians, they were actually just Baptists by another name. The 19th century Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon put it this way, We believe that the Baptists are the original Christians, we did not commence our existence at the Reformation. We were Reformers before Luther and Calvin were born. We never came from the Church of Rome, for we were never in it, but we have an unbroken line up to the apostles themselves. We have always existed from the days of Christ, and our principles, sometimes veiled and forgotten, like a river which may travel underground for a little season, have always had honest and holy adherence. This view was made popular in 1931 by Baptist author James Milton Carroll in his book, The Trail of Blood. It's also called Landmarkism, because they believe that even though these older heresies like the Cathars, they weren't exactly like modern Baptists, they still held to landmarks of doctrine related to things like baptism and church governance, which would make them part of the true church. The problem is that Baptist scholars have abandoned this theory of church history. You could even say it was the Baptist scholar James Edward McGoldrick, who once held to the theory, who effectively killed it with his book, Baptist Successionism, A Crucial Question in Baptist History. The main arguments against Baptist secessionism are that these heretical groups that people think were Baptists they didn't believe the things many people like John MacArthur believe in today, like that your salvation can't be lost. They didn't believe that. Plus, they did believe in things that Protestants and even Christians today in general don't believe in. One example would be the Cathars. 
they denied the traditional doctrine of the Trinity, and they thought that matter and sexual intercourse were evil. McGoldrick puts the whole theory this way. Although free church groups in ancient and medieval times sometimes promoted doctrines and practices agreeable to modern Baptists, when judged by standards now acknowledged as Baptistic, not one of them merits recognition as a Baptist church. Baptists arose in the 17th century in Holland and England. They are Protestants, heirs of the Reformers. So MacArthur can either make the historically implausible claim that Calvinist doctrines, Baptist doctrines have always been believed by some remnant in church history, or he can say that these doctrines sprang up from nothing in the 16th century, like how Mormon doctrines arose spontaneously in the 19th century. But he can't say there have always been his version of true believers throughout history, because that's not what the evidence shows. Do the early church fathers have unanimous agreement on the doctrine of the Catholic Church? Absolutely not. Uh, somebody said years ago, and I think there's a certain amount of truth, you can prove almost anything by going to the church fathers. Because there's so much diversity, and because you don't always know the context, you can take what they say and, and send it one direction or another. But how could the early church fathers support unanimously the doctrines of the Catholic Church when the doctrines of the Catholic Church didn't even develop until after the church fathers? I mean, there are so many components of Catholicism that, that came after the church fathers. Uh, in the council, say, from 325 to 725, there were solid things that were decided that the church fathers would agree on, things that had to do with Trinitarianism and the deity of Christ and things like that. But all kinds of things developed in Catholicism over time that the early church fathers don't even address. Actually, you can find Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses who use the early church fathers to promote their views. After all, the word Trinity doesn't appear in the church fathers until the end of the second century. And the theology of the fathers during this early time period is not as refined as the later sources. That's why the most important ecumenical councils dealing with these subjects, like Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, Chalcedon, they all took place in the 4th and 5th centuries. And while it's true the fathers do disagree with each other on some issues, on major issues related to Catholic doctrine, we do find unanimous agreement. Agreement in belief about things like baptismal regeneration or the sacrament of holy orders. Is there such a thing as apostolic succession and does it prove that Rome is a true church? Uh, that's easy to answer. There is no such thing as apostolic succession. It cannot be proven at all. In fact, the apostolate is a self-contained group. We know exactly who the apostles are because they were witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even the apostle Paul feels a little bit guilty in calling himself an apostle, so he has to say, I was, a, I was an apostle sort of born out of the normal time. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of a, of, a, of a late entry, an addendum to the whole thing, but he understands the nature of that apostleship is that he himself has also seen the resurrected Christ. And I think when you have the end of the, the ministry of the Apostle Paul, clearly you, you have the terminus point of the apostolate. There is nothing in the Bible to justify any kind of extension of the apostolate beyond that. Uh, especially the, the fabrication that somehow the apostolate winds up in Rome and belongs to a pope. Um, no one could be an apostle who hadn't seen the risen Christ. That was a qualification given clearly in the New Testament. Catholics would agree with MacArthur that the office of apostle no longer exists in the church. But that doesn't mean the apostle's spiritual authority died with them. First, the Bible never says an apostle had to have been a witness of Jesus' resurrection. That was a requirement in the first chapter of Acts for Matthias, who replaced Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, but it wasn't a universal requirement for all apostles. Acts 14.14 14 says, When the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this idolatrous worship given to them, they tore their garments and rushed out among the multitude. Notice that Barnabas is called an apostle, even though the New Testament never says that he was a witness of the risen Jesus. Second, there is far more evidence that Jesus and the apostles gave ecclesial authority to an office of successors than to a collection of writings. For example, Jesus never told anyone prior to his ascension into heaven to ever write anything down, and the apostles never taught that a collection of writings would become the church's supreme authority.
Instead, the first Christians formed their allegiance around the apostles' successors, or the bishops. That's why St. Ignatius of Antioch, at the beginning of the second century, told his listeners to do nothing apart from the bishop. And Clement of Rome, he said this in the first century, Our apostles also knew through our Lord Jesus Christ that there would be strife on account of the office of the episcopate. For this reason, therefore, inasmuch as they had obtained a perfect foreknowledge of this, they appointed those ministers already mentioned and afterwards gave instructions that when these should fall asleep, other approved men should succeed them in their ministry. By the end of the second century, St. Irenaeus said this, It is incumbent to obey the presbyters who are in the church, or the priests, those who, as I have shown, possess the succession from the apostles, those who, together with the succession of the episcopate, have received the infallible charism of truth, according to the good pleasure of the Father. Is there any circular reasoning in, uh, in saying that the Catholic Church is infallible? <laughs> of course there is. Um, uh, you know, they got you in a corner, uh, because uh, it, if you say that they're infallible, then uh, you, you sort of, that's a presupposition. They can't prove that, because that in itself is a statement that's subject to scrutiny. Uh, it's clear that they're not infallible, because they're in error about so many doctrines. Uh, they, they misrepresent the New Testament. They teach a wrong doctrine of salvation. Clearly, they're not infallible. To, to, to say that I accept the infallibility of the church is to accept a statement by a fallible organization that they're infallible. I mean, just look at the history of the church. The, the fallibility of the Roman system ought to be very clear. They are doctrinally in error. The alternative, of course, is that the church is infallible, and it is Pastor MacArthur's doctrine that is in error that the, the system is full of um, scandalous conduct from the papacy on down. They have misrepresented history. They, they literally massacred true believers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what you've got is you've got a fallible system claiming infallibility and people just accepting that claim as some kind of an established presupposition. Uh, obviously, the church is not infallible, uh, but they want to establish their infallibility because then they're in control of everything. So if you grant them that, that's the end of the discussion. MacArthur's objection is interesting because in other contexts, he thinks it's perfectly okay to just presuppose the Bible is infallible without having to prove it's infallible. Here's some examples. Why, why should they take the Bible seriously in the first place? Well, I think the Bible is its own defense. Um, I've never defended the Bible. I've just preached it for almost 60 years. I will not put my faith in human reason. That the power is not in evidences to the rational mind, but the power is in the proclamation of the Word of God. But a presuppositional apologist, and the presupposition was that the Bible is true. So why can Protestants say we can presuppose a certain collection of writings is infallible, but Catholics can't do that with the church that compiled those writings into an authoritative canon that has been preserved through the church's liturgy and sacred tradition. Protestants get to do presuppositions. Why can't Catholics? Of course, Catholics don't make a circular presupposition that the church is infallible merely because the church says so. Instead, we start with ancient documents that show, through historical reasoning, the best explanation for the origin of Christianity is that Jesus is God and he rose from the dead. And from there, we can use those same documents to show that Christ established a church that would provide historical continuity for and maintain the deposit of faith. This would include teaching about what constitutes sacred scripture itself. Yeah, I think the definition of a church is, is simply the assembly of believers. It doesn't define an institution of any kind of human structure or perpetuity. It only describes the assembly of believers. There is a physical element of the church, and when, when believers actually physically get together, there is a spiritual component of the church, and that is the spiritual body of Christ, the assembling together on the spiritual level of believers' like-minded faith. But beyond that, the New Testament doesn't define the church in any institutional way. What about Hebrews thirteen seventeen? Obey your leaders and submit to them. 
for they are keeping watch over your souls as men who will have to give account. And Acts 14.23 tells us it was the apostles who chose these men to be leaders, not the community and not the men themselves. Or what about Matthew 18, 15 through 17, that talks about what to do if your brother sins against you. It says that you should go to your brother, and then if he resolves it, great. If not, take one or two others along with you. Uh, But if he doesn't even listen to that, it says in verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Notice that Jesus did not say, tell it to your church. He spoke of the church, which implies that the believers were to be united organizationally as well as doctrinally. Without this kind of organizational union, if you have a dispute with a brother or a sinner has been excommunicated, he can just walk down the street and go to another church. But that's not how it was in the first century. Protestant scholar D.A. Carson writes, Only church, ecclesia in the singular, is used for the congregation of all believers in one city. Never churches. The New Testament clearly teaches that the church has authority over believers. If the church is just everyone who says they're Christian, then there is no single body that can exercise authority over us, just a massive contradictory blob of voices espousing different doctrines. The church can only have authority if it has an authoritative structure or a hierarchy and authoritative rights. And we see this in Jesus' promises to Peter and the apostles that they would be able to bind and loose. The Lutheran professor Tord Fornberg actually says, Peter stands out as a kind of chief rabbi who binds and looses in the sense of declaring something to be forbidden or permitted. Peter is looked upon as a counterpart to the high priest. He is the highest representative for the people of God. No, uh, does the lack of, uh, of uh, central authority in the, in the diverse uh, Protestant church prove the need for a monolithic uh, central authority such as in the Roman Catholic Church? Um, I understand why the Catholic Church wanted to hold on to its authority. They did fear what would happen if there was autonomy. And there were some things that they feared that were true. Uh, it, without a central authority, you know, you can have essentially no control. We do have that in Protestantism. I think the, the latest count is 28,000 Protestant denominations. And each of them must have some justifying nuance, some variation that causes them to, to exist. I understand that. And I understand it would be an awful lot better if the church was, was gathered into one great body. But that has nothing to do with a uh, presupposed uh, authority. That has to do with accuracy connected to the Word of God. The church can't rally around some, some self-appointed central authority. The church has to come back to the truth of Scripture. And what, the only thing that can really unite the church is a common belief in the veracity and the accurate interpretation of Scripture. But of course, this raises the question, but of course, this raises the question, which interpretation of Scripture are we talking about? What counts as Scripture? When you look in church history, it was clear among the fathers that it was the church, not an informal collection of believers, but an enduring authoritative hierarchy that guided believers. The Protestant historian Mark Ellingson says that when it comes to St. Augustine, for example, he says, when decisions were to be made about ecclesiastical matters, Augustine appealed to both the Bible and tradition, allowing them to function, especially in cases where Scripture laid down no definite rule. Indeed, against the Manichae heretics, Augustine contended that the reason for believing is not found in the Scriptures alone, but is grounded in the Catholic tradition. That's also why in the 5th century, St. Vincent of Lorenz wrote this. He said, Therefore, it is very necessary, on account of so great intricacies of such various error, that the rule for the right understanding of the prophets and apostles should be framed in accordance with the standard of ecclesiastical and Catholic interpretation. Well, yeah, the question is, uh, you know, why are we so, as Protestants, so fixed on the idea that uh, the Scripture alone is our authority? Because uh, 
Roman Catholics say there's nothing in the Bible that forbids an additional authority. Well, first of all, that's an argument from silence. Uh, to say that you are mandated by something the Bible does not say is, is, is really ridiculous. I mean, because there's no end to what the Bible does not say. You could invent all kinds of things the Bible does not say. You can't use that as a basis for divine uh, authority. No one is arguing that the church has divine authority merely because the Bible never forbids the existence of a church with this authority. That's a straw man argument. Instead, the argument is that the Bible does not teach sola scriptura. This means you can't start with the presupposition, the Bible alone is our only source of divine revelation or divine authority. Instead, the evidence from the Bible and Christian history attests to the existence of a single, infallible church that preserves the authority of the apostles through a series of successors. Um, the scripture, however, on the other hand, claims to be the only authority. I mean, you have statements, for example, at the end of the book of Revelation, it says if you add anything to this book or take anything away from it, shall be added to you the plagues that are written in it. That's pretty explicit. That only proves you can't add or take away words from the book of Revelation. Even if it applied to the whole Bible, Catholics are still fine because we aren't adding anything to God's written word. If anything, Protestants should be concerned about this warning because they removed the seven deuterocanonical books in Scripture, like Tobit and Maccabees, that were in the Old Testament used by Jesus and the Apostles. Check out my other video on that subject uh, for more on that. Uh, you have, I think, that wonderful statement in Jude, that this is the faith once for all delivered to the saints. You have a, you have a faith packaged by divine revelation once for all delivered. It doesn't keep going and keep going and keep going. That is, that is uh, one of the severest errors in Roman Catholicism, is that they don't have any end to the true canon of divine revelation. It just keeps going and going and going. And that's their affinity with the charismatic movement, where you continue to have people having revelations and revelations and revelations and revelations. They, too, do not understand the uniqueness of Scripture, uh, which I believe is the only divine revelation and and authority for the rule and practice of life in the church. Catholics agree with MacArthur that public revelation ended with the death of the last apostle or last apostolic man, like Mark or Luke. But what's interesting is the New Testament doesn't explicitly teach this. And you can't use Jude 3, the faith delivered once and for all to the saints, as a proof text, because we don't know if Jude was the last book of the New Testament that was written. Even if Jude were the last book of the New Testament that was written, it wouldn't prove this doctrine about the end of public revelation. In fact, MacArthur proves this in a 2003 article he wrote in the Master's Seminar Journal. He says there that the Greek word in Jude 3 for delivered, it, quote, refers to an act completed in the past with no continuing element. And he also says the phrase once for all in the passage means nothing needs to be added to the faith that has been delivered once for all. But this would mean that the faith had been delivered before Jude was written, which means that Jude and any teaching in it about the end of public revelation wouldn't be part of the deposit of faith at all. So MacArthur even says that this verse penned by Jude before the New Testament was complete, nevertheless looked forward to the completion of the entire canon. So all of this shows that using Jude 3 to prove public revelation ceased in the first century, it doesn't work because it confuses giving the faith to the saints with public revelation. Jesus gave the faith once and for all to the apostles. But the public revelation of the faith continued for decades after Jesus' interactions with the apostles during the writing of the New Testament. And there isn't any explicit biblical evidence that this revelation ceased after the death of the last apostle or apostolic man, or may maybe it continued for centuries. In fact, there's, there's also no evidence that there were no more living apostles who could give revelation. Now, our knowledge that revelation ended and that there are no living apostles, it comes from things like sacred tradition. Also, MacArthur seems to be taking his sola scriptura argument to the next level in saying that God has not only publicly revealed himself only in Scripture, but that he has only revealed himself in Scripture. This relates to a dispute among Protestants over whether God continues to give people miraculous gifts. 
MacArthur says that God doesn't, and this position would be in line with Pastor Tom Pennington. He talks about this view in this way. It's called cessationism. So what do we mean by cessationism? We mean that the Spirit no longer sovereignly gives individual believers the miraculous spiritual gifts that are listed in the Scripture and that were present in the first century church. It is neither the Spirit's plan nor his normal pattern to distribute miraculous spiritual gifts to Christians and churches today as he did in the times of the apostles. Those gifts ceased as normative with the apostles. If you go back to the Protestant Reformation, one argument that pops up is the argument for miracles. Basically, Catholic apologists said that Christ established the church, and we can know this because of all the miracles that were performed by Catholic saints throughout history. And since the Protestant reformers didn't have any miracles to validate their claims, the Catholic apologists in the 16th century argued that we shouldn't believe the Reformation is of God. Now, in the preface to the Institutes for Christian Religion, the Protestant reformer John Calvin, he admits Protestants didn't have miracles to back up their claims, like Catholics. But he said that Protestants are only reaffirming what the apostles miraculously taught, so they don't need miracles of their own. However, he claimed miracles would only be found in apostolic churches, which means that Catholic miracles have to be false, since Calvin believed the church is not apostolic. He writes of Catholics, They allege miracles which might produce wavering in minds otherwise well disposed. They are so frivolous and ridiculous, so vain and false. It becomes us to remember that Satan has his miracles, which, although they are tricks rather than true wonders, are still such as to delude the ignorant and unwary. So, according to Calvin, Catholic miracles must be deceptions or demonic. They can't be genuine because Catholicism is not apostolic in nature. However, many Protestants believe the Bible's teachings about spiritual gifts does not have an expiration date. So, unlike those who think that spiritual gifts have ceased, or cessationists, these Protestants believe the gifts continue in the Church, which is why they call themselves continuationists. Although I like this warning from cessationist Tom Pennington. Uh, Pennington says that Protestants who believe in the continuing gifts of the Holy Spirit, continuing miracles, they leave themselves open to accepting the continuing authority of the apostles and church leaders who regulated these gifts in the first place. He writes, When charismatics state their case against cessationism, as Protestant author Andrew Wilson does, they unintentionally also surrender the field to apostolic succession. In other words, if it makes sense to say the gifts of the Holy Spirit given to the apostles continued past the apostolic age, then it makes sense to say the authority given to the apostles continued past the apostolic age as well. When tradition uh, contradicts Scripture, which has the authority? Um, and the answer, of course, is Scripture. And I think uh, Matthew 15 uh, is a very, very important passage in that regard. Jesus indicts the Pharisees, and he makes a very specific indictment. He says, uh, you have substituted the traditions of men for the commandments of God. That's exactly what Judaism had done. Judaism is a very, very uh, good parallel to Catholicism, because there was, there was revelation there, Old Testament, but there was massive tradition there, and the tradition was used in two ways. It was used to add to the revelation and to interpret the revelation. The tradition would be the, the Mishnah, the codification of Jewish law, rabbinical interpretation, etc. So you've got this true revelation, namely the Old Testament, and then you've got this mass of material uh, which essentially sort of relates to the magisterium in, in Catholic tradition. It's this accumulated stuff that interprets the Old Testament and establishes tradition. And by the time you get to Jesus, the truth of the Old Testament has been totally obscured and lost in the confounding machinations of all this tradition. And essentially, that's what Jesus confronts. He says, you know, you've totally obliterated the commandments of God by your traditions. And essentially, that's what's happened with the Catholic Church. First, Jesus didn't condemn tradition. He condemned the traditions of men. Counterfeit sacred traditions don't disprove the existence of genuine sacred tradition any more than counterfeit sacred scripture, like apocryphal gospels in the 2nd and 3rd century, 
they don't disprove the existence of genuine sacred scripture. Also, what's ironic is that the dispute over tradition, it deals with the Pharisees having an incorrect interpretation of the Bible, not some tradition that was just totally foreign to scripture. The Pharisees believe that if a man vowed a gift to God through a donation to the temple, he could not go back on the vow. If he went back on his vow to give money to the temple, that would contradict Numbers 30, chapter 30, verse 2, which says if a man vows to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself, he shall not break his word. He shall do, do all according to what proceeds out of his mouth. And now in the time of Jesus, by the way, this is talking about the Korban rule. Uh, korban meant vow more than offering. So the point is that even if a man's vow of giving to the temple, giving money to the temple, caused his parents financial hardship, Numbers 32 seems clear. He can't break his vow. But Jesus said, look, the vow is invalid from the start. The man had no right to donate money to the temple that he should have used to support his aging parents. In short, the statute in the book of Numbers not to break vows to the Lord is superseded by the commandment in the book of Exodus to honor your father and your mother. So this Korban dispute, it wasn't a case of Jesus correcting the Pharisees from importing an extra biblical tradition into their faith. It's more like the Pharisees had embraced, they'd embraced a tradition of interpreting scripture that was of human rather than divine origin. And so Jesus responded by correcting their misunderstanding of the sacred word. And the Catholic Church sees sacred tradition as playing a similar role today in that it guides the church in her understanding of God's written word. Uh, a truth we will see, actually, in the early Christian's testimony about tradition. Does the Bible teach anywhere that traditions are inspired or, or sufficient? No, the Bible never teaches that traditions are inspired. The Word of God is inspired, and that's all. Uh, traditions which are basically devised by men at some point in history have nothing to do with the revelation of God. Uh, the revelation of God is once for all delivered to the saints. It is comprehensive. It is complete. It is finished with the book of Revelation. Don't add anything. Don't take anything away. This is it. Uh, traditions are simply the inventions of men that, that embellish the Word of God or, or add to the Word of God as time goes on. There is, there's no comparison between the two. The Greek word that is translated inspired in 2 Timothy 3.16 is theonoustos, and it's only used once in the Bible to refer to Scripture. But the Church Fathers used the word theonoustos to refer to all kinds of writings, even non-biblical ones. So the point is that divine revelation does not exist only in what the Bible calls theonoustos. But the Bible is also clear that the teachings of the apostles were not confined to the written word. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. Simply the true gospel, and I, I think maybe the best way to say it is, um, is to understand 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin, sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the gospel. And I, I think... Uh, it needs to be understood in this context. The, the context of, of uh, 2 Corinthians 5 is, is a context of reconciliation. Five times from verse 18 to 21, the word reconciliation is used in some form. And what the passage is saying is, the good news is that sinners can be reconciled to God. Okay, that's the good news. This is a difficult verse to use as the summary of the gospel because it's subject to different interpretations including ones the Church Fathers held that don't line up with Calvinism. Since MacArthur will go into the verse in more detail later, I'll save my comments for then. The good news here is, and the Catholics miss this altogether, they've got God as a tough guy, really a tough guy. You don't want to go to him. And even Jesus is a tough guy. You don't want to go to Jesus because Jesus might just be either indifferent to you or really upset. This is all very ironic coming from a Calvinist like John MacArthur. If the Catholic God is a tough guy, then the Calvinist God is a psychopath. He, the Calvinist God alone decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And if you think that's unfair, then tough, because he's God and you aren't. In fact, when MacArthur was asked how he could tell anybody Jesus loves them, 
even though there's a good chance that Jesus did not die for them. And so God chose for them to be damned for all eternity, according to Calvinism. This is how MacArthur answered. How do we tell people God loves them and that Jesus Christ did not die for them? Or do we tell them that? Well, you tell them whatever the Bible tells you to tell them. And the Bible tells you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what you do because that's what the Scripture says. Any tension you have between that and the nature of the atonement, any tension you have between that and the doctrine of divine election and predestination, any tension you feel in those areas, I feel. Spurgeon said, if you'll pull up their shirts and show me an E stamped on their back and I know the elect, I'll, I'll limit my work to them. But since there is no such stamp, um, I am committed to obey the command to preach the gospel to every creature. And it's a, good, it's a good question to answer because you guys want to be very careful in the tensions that are in this, and it flows through every major doctrine in Scripture that connects the sinner with God. You don't want to resolve that tension by asking philosophical questions. You always want to live in that tension by being obedient to Scripture. So don't tell me the Catholic God is some tough guy we can't relate to when the Calvinist God sends people to hell simply because it makes him look good, or as a Calvinist would put it, it glorifies his justice. So you better go to Mary because Mary's sweet and she's nice and even Jesus can't resist her. So go to her and she'll go beg Jesus, convince Jesus, and Jesus will get the Father to to save you. Nothing could be a more bizarre and untrue representation of the nature of God. Except in Romans 8.34, Paul says, Is it Christ Jesus who died? Yes, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. So Christ intercedes for us, and we are called to intercede for one another before Christ. If not, then we we can never ask anyone else to pray for us, because that would be weird. It would seem like we were too scared to go to God directly if we asked somebody else to pray for us. Instead, we trust in God and his promise that we are all one body, and each part of the body of Christ carries the burdens of the other parts. And part of the way we do that is by praying for one another, and that the body of Christ extends even beyond death, because Jesus has conquered death. God is the Savior of all men. By nature, God is a reconciler. Even, the, uh, even sinners, even the ungodly who hate God, feel the reality of his saving nature. How? The rain falls on the just and the unjust. The fact that a sinner takes one breath after his first sin is evidence that God is by nature gracious. He's by nature merciful. That's why 1 Timothy 4.10 says he's the Savior of all men. But MacArthur doesn't really believe this because he thinks that Jesus only died for the elect or the people who are going to heaven. That's why I like this bumper sticker slogan for Calvinism. Calvinism. Jesus might have died for you. Instead, MacArthur has to misinterpret Scripture to make passages that say God wants all men to be saved, to mean all kinds of men, or all Christian men, or other notions that just contradict the text's plain meaning. Temporally, in time, he shows his saving nature. It's like Romans 2, the forbearance of God, the patience of God. So I think to to understand the gospel, you have to understand that God is by nature a reconciler. And you see it in Jesus who comes to seek and to save the lost. You see it in Jesus crying over the city of Jerusalem, saying, you will not come to me that you might have life. Another interesting contradiction is that Calvinists like John MacArthur believe that when God calls his people to salvation, that call cannot be resisted. This is irresistible grace, or what MacArthur labels an effectual call. God calls us, and it always has a saving effect. Or we can't say no to God's offer of salvation. Here's how MacArthur describes it. Those whom he called. What what, what do you mean called? Well, we don't mean like an invitation. We don't mean like it says in the Gospels, um, many are called. Now we're talking about what theologians have called an effectual call or an effective call or a powerful call or I love these historic words, an irresistible call. It is not a call that comes to the ears to be rejected or accepted. It is an internal call, and that's what sets it apart. But in Acts 7.51, St. Stephen told the Jewish leaders, You stiff-necked people, 
uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. And speaking of Jesus crying over Jerusalem, in Matthew 23, 37, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. So while Calvinism maintains that God's grace is irresistible, a person cannot refuse God's offer of salvation, the Bible is clear that God wanted to gather the people of Jerusalem together, and they refused him, and that people can refuse the Holy Spirit because God does not force belief. He instead invites every single human being to eternal life with him. So it's interesting that MacArthur criticizes Catholicism for its apparently unbiblical doctrines, while he's okay living in the tension that his unbiblical Calvinist beliefs create for him. You see it in Jesus when he says, uh, uh, why, or God, when he says, why will you die? I mean, God is by nature a savior. And I think Roman Catholic theology completely misses that. You don't have to beg God through Mary or beg Mary through some saint or beg Jesus through some saint to get to God to somehow appease God. God is by nature a savior. An incarnate God, Jesus Christ, obviously is the savior who pleads with sinners. And you have in that same passage, 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul says that um, God is begging you through us to be reconciled to him. That's an amazing statement. Notice in that passage that God sought the reconciliation of sinners through intermediaries, people like Paul who were given the ministry of reconciliation, people like the apostles. And as we've already noted, Catholic doctrine does not prohibit someone from praying directly to God. In fact, it encourages it. Think about the litany of the, the Sacred Heart, the devotion to the Sacred Heart. Catholics pray directly to the Father and ask him to have mercy on us and on the whole world because of his son's sorrowful passion. God is begging sinners to be reconciled to him. Now, the, that's the good news, that you can be reconciled. Now, the only way that can happen, according to that passage, is if God does not impute their trespasses against them. God is holy. God is just. He's got a problem here. He's a savior by nature. He, he desires to save sinners. The only way he can do it is by not imputing their trespasses against them. That is to say, he can't hold them against them. He can't indict them for their sins. He can't credit them to their account. So MacArthur is going to outline a common but not universal view in Protestantism called imputed righteousness. The idea here is that God basically swaps our sins for Christ's righteousness, and that is why we can spend eternity with God. Think about the movie Freaky Friday, where Lindsay Lohan and Jamie Lee Curtis swap bodies, or Barbara Harris and Jodie Foster, if you remember the 1976 original version. Anyways, in this case, God swaps our sins and places them on Jesus on the cross. Jesus doesn't literally become a sinner, but he is literally punished for our sins because now he has them. When the Father sees the Son on the cross, he sees our sins and pours out his wrath upon the Son. But when the swap happens and God looks at us, he doesn't see our sins anymore. He just sees Christ's righteousness instead. So that's Protestant imputed righteousness. And what's important to remember is that our own righteousness doesn't change under this view. God just covers our sins with Christ's righteousness. Martin Luther compared this to how on a farm dung heaps might be covered with pure white snow. The dung heap remains, but it's no longer seen. The same happens with our sins. Well, how's he going to do that? How's he going to get rid of that problem because he's a just God? Answer, verse 21, he made him who knew no sin, sin for us. What he did was indict Jesus for our sins. MacArthur is also falsely assuming that someone has to be punished in order for us to be saved. But St. Thomas Aquinas showed that God didn't have to be crucified to save us. God's omnipotent. There are many ways he could have forgiven us. He could have just made a divine decree. He's God. Who's to say he can't? Instead, Christ's sacrifice serves as a visceral reminder of God's love for us, since it wasn't required for our salvation, but it was a fitting means to obtain it and demonstrate God's love for us. To put it simply, here's the good news. On the cross, 
God treated Jesus as if he had personally committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe, though in fact he committed none of them. That's how he was made sin. Only in that sense. He didn't become a sinner. He was made sin only in the sense that God treated him as if he had personally committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe, though in fact he committed none of them. That's the doctrine of substitution. So that Jesus literally dies under the full fury of God against every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe. And justice is satisfied at that point. First, what is the punishment for all the sins humanity has committed? Wouldn't it be eternal damnation? But Jesus didn't spend eternity in hell, so we have a problem with this view. Either Jesus failed to be punished f to the extent that our sins require, or eternity in hell, or the only punishment our sins do require is what Jesus suffered, biological death, not hell. So Pastor MacArthur's interpretation of 2 Corinthians 5, it either guts the traditional doctrine of hell or the Protestant doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement, since Jesus didn't really receive the punishment we deserve. This is why Catholic models of the atonement that focus more on the atonement being a sacrifice of love offered on our behalf that pays for our sins, uh, it makes more sense than the penal view that says Jesus was an innocent person punished in our place. Second, this isn't how 2 Corinthians 5.21 was traditionally understood throughout church history. Several church fathers said that this verse is talking about not imputation of sin, but the incarnation. Jesus became human, and human beings, it's the likeness of sinful flesh, being human. St. Augustine said, Therefore, having no sin of his own, nevertheless, on account of the likeness of sinful flesh in which he came, he was called sin, that he might be sacrificed to wash away sin. Even John Calvin used 2 Corinthians 5.21 in this way. He did so when he was defending the importance of Christ's humanity in the atonement. The idea here being that, he is made to be sin means he is human, and we identify humanity itself with a fallen nature. Not that Jesus is fallen, Jesus is not sinful, but he became human, and human beings are plagued by sin. So this is what he writes. He performed all these things in his human nature. Righteousness was manifested to us in his flesh. He places the fountain of righteousness entirely in the incarnation of Christ. He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This also corresponds to Romans 8.3, which says, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. This reminds me of another interpretation that is made for made him to be sin. It means made him to be a sin offering or a sacrifice. In Greek, the word for sin, hamartias, it can also mean sin offering or a sacrifice to take away sin. Hebrews 10.6, for example, quotes Psalm 40 referring to sacrifices, and it uses the word in this way. It says, literally in Greek, burnt offerings and for sin you have not delighted in. Though most translators render sin in this passage, sin offering, because that makes the most sense of the context. I would say the same is true of 2 Corinthians 5.21, because Paul makes it clear Christ himself is a Passover sacrifice. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5.7, Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Paschal Lamb, has been sacrificed. So to summarize, 2 Corinthians 5.21 does not refute the Catholic understanding of Christ's atoning death, and it's perfectly compatible with the Catholic Church, with the Catholic description of how Christ offered himself as a sacrifice of love that pays the debt incurred by all of our sins. Then it's up to each individual to freely choose to allow God to apply the effects of that sacrifice to their soul. This includes being baptized— being and in, acquiring initial salvation, and then living a life of obedience to God that doesn't throw away the value of the sacrifice.
Hebrews 10, 26 through 27 even says, For if we sin deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful prospect of judgment. And the good news then is then that he bore in his body our sins on the cross. And that's a done deal. That's a settled fact. It's not in question. We don't have to wait till after death to find out if it happened. Under MacArthur's view, after the crucifixion, the fate of the elect that God had predestined was now sealed. Everyone God chose to be saved, would be saved. Nothing's ever going to change that. But your knowledge of whether you belong to the elect who will be saved, or you're just a false believer who only thinks he's going to be saved, that doesn't become infallible until after death. So this view gives you no more psychological security about knowing whether you're saved than the Catholic view. Uh, we don't have to do something along the way to activate uh, some elements of that offered salvation to make it ours. We don't have to cooperate with, by some infused grace with what God is doing. It is a done thing. Christ pays the penalty in full. That's justification by grace. And it is apprehended by faith. If we do absolutely nothing to be saved, including cooperating with God's grace to accept his offer of salvation in the first place, if we do nothing at all, even help by grace to be saved, if we do nothing, then God does everything to send people to hell. It's a mutually exclu they're mutually exclusive, and it's the logical consequence of Calvinism. If the decision of who goes to heaven is 100% up to God and man has no say in it whatsoever— then the decision of who goes to hell is 100% up to God as well. And so we have here the monstrous doctrine of double predestination, where God literally sends people to hell. We simply accept it by believing it. Then the rest of the verse, which I think is so monumental, says that we might be made, now Christ was made sin, same verb, that we might be made righteous, the very righteousness of God in him. That, too, is an incredible statement. I'm not sure what MacArthur is getting at here, because in this passage, Paul uses two different Greek words, which implies that we don't become righteous in the same way Christ becomes sin. Christ is made sin, epoison, from the Greek word poeo. This word also has a sacrificial context. In Luke 22:19, Jesus says of the Eucharist, poeo, using the word poeo, do this in remembrance of me. Meanwhile, we are genomatha, from the Greek word genomai. We become righteous. The same root word is used in Galatians 4.4 4 to talk about Christ becoming man. The Catholic view of infused righteousness actually holds up better here in saying that when Christ offers himself as a sacrificial offering to take away sin, his righteousness is applied to us and transforms us so that we really do, we become pleasing in God's sight. We've become righteous by putting on Christ. Galatians 2.20 puts it well by saying this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 underscores this transformation in Christ by saying, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all of this fulfills the promise that God made in the prophet Ezekiel, that God would eventually make us not just obedient in our words and deeds to the law, but he would, he would change us. So our very being longs to be obedient to him. Ezekiel says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, fulfilled in baptism, I would say, and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take out of your flesh the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. If you've ever wondered, for example, why Jesus lived 30 years, obscure, nobody, nobody was commissioned by God to write any of it down, one little incident at the age of 12. Other than that, we don't know anything about 30 years. I suppose if I'd have been God, I could say, you know, you need to go down and die for sinners, but I only need you for the weekend. You go down on Friday, you die, you're back Sunday afternoon. You know, there's some 
there's some truth that that, that that could work because really after all all he did uh, have to do was take the wrath of God for sinners and he could have done that on the weekend the question is why did he live a full life why did he live 33 years answer because he said as he told John the Baptist I must fulfill all righteousness here's the point he needed to live a perfectly righteous life so that that perfectly righteous life could be credited to your account Jesus is talking about why he submitted to baptism he didn't need, not why he became incarnate, which, as we saw, it was not necessary for our salvation. The Catechism says, The baptism of Jesus is on his part the acceptance and inauguration of his mission as God's suffering servant. He allows himself to be numbered among sinners. He is already the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Already he is anticipating the baptism of his bloody death. Already he is coming to fulfill all righteousness. That is, he is submitting himself entirely to his Father's will. Out of love, he consents to this baptism of death for the remission of our sins. Once again, it was fitting for God to choose to save us in this way. But it's not like God's hands were tied and he had to do it this way. To understand the good news is this. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he lived your life. So that he could treat you as if you lived his life. That's the remarkable doctrine of imputation. Our sins imputed to him, his righteousness imputed to us. God treats him as if he lived our lives, treats us now as if we lived his. That's the good news. And there's nothing of works in it. It's all of grace, it's all of faith, and it's all accomplished by Christ. Well, Rome's gospel is different than the gospel uh, of the Bible because Rome, Rome's gospel assumes human cooperation. The traditional Christian view, not just the Catholic view, the traditional Christian view, not just the Catholic view, assumes we cooperate with God to ensure our salvation. Calvinists like MacArthur will rip on this, calling it synergism. God doesn't need synergy. He does it all himself. But 1 Corinthians 3.9 says we are God's fellow workers. Or in Greek, we are synergoi theou. It uses the word from which we get synergy. Synergoi theou. We are God's fellow workers. Our cooperation with God, with his grace, does not take away from God's sovereignty in the slightest. Um, essentially, what happens in the Gospel of Rome is you have infused grace. That There is a grace that is infused into a person. I think initially at infant baptism, there's an infusion of this grace. Sequentially, there are other infusions of this grace. Um, at the Mass, at any of the, 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 the Catholic ordinances, the, the, the grace is infused. That's why, you know, they used to say of, of, of a devout Catholic, you went to church every day. You know, the, the idea was every time you go, you get some infusion of grace. And that that infused grace, which is in you, given by God, if you cooperate with it, puts you on a path of justification. Justification not then being an act accomplished by substitutionary death in Christ, but justification being a process. And as you cooperate and uh, do what you can to avoid uh, venial sins and mortal sins and go through the confessions and and uh, penance and all of that, as you go through the process, you're sort of working your way along with this infused grace, you're cooperating to carry off this justification process. Uh, bottom line, you don't know whether you ever get there. As I said before, the same uncertainty exists for Calvinists, because they could think that they're saved, but then if they commit a grave sin, they might think, I got to ask God for forgiveness, because if I don't, that proves I was never saved in the first place. Look, nearly every Christian seeks God through faith, and they understand that in doing so, they have to live a life in conformity with God's law. Now, some people are going to say, well, we're not under law, we're under grace. But Paul says in Galatians, the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he tells the Galatians, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6.2. James 2.8 even says that we do well when we fulfill the royal law according to Scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Probably you won't, so you'll have to go to purgatory. And when you go to purgatory, there'll be some, so there's a price to pay. You've got to stay there a while until the process gets completed, until you get purged, 
Um, and when you've been purged of any remaining uh, problems uh, and you finally reach the point of justification, you can get elevated into heaven. Um, not at all what the Bible teaches. How, how do the teachings of uh, the mass purgatory and uh, good works take away from, uh, from the gospel of Christ and, and the finished work of Christ? Well, obviously, if you add any component other than what Christ did, you've confounded the gospel. If there's any works in there at all, Paul says to the Romans, grace is no more grace. Um, it's all of Christ. I'll recall what I said in my rebuttal to Mike Winger, because MacArthur is making the same mistake with Romans 11.6. This passage is talking about why, historically, some Jews belonged to a faithful remnant of Israel and others didn't. They came into the covenant community not through any merit of their own, but just through God's grace. But the thing is, the Catholic Church teaches the same thing about coming into the New Covenant community. The Catechism says in paragraph 2010, no one can ever merit the initial grace we receive in baptism. We just receive it. But none of this shows that merit or good works have nothing to do with the rest of our life in Christ. And as soon as you add the, the Mass as some some component that infuses something into us with which we cooperate, now you've got us involved. As soon as you add purgatory, you, you're really saying Christ didn't do the work. Justification is not a completed thing. And of course, that's the big difference. We believe justification is a divine act by which God, in a moment as it were, declares the sinner righteous on the basis of what Christ has already done because Christ has already received the full fury of God for all his sins. Catholics agree that when we are justified, God does declare we are righteous, but his declaration also has real effects. It isn't a mere legal declaration. It's like when God says, let there be light, and then something actually happens. The big difference between Catholic and Protestant views on justification is that we don't see the Protestant view, we don't agree of it being a mere legal declaration in a courtroom where God finds us not guilty, even though we're still ontologically guilty of being sinners. It's more like a familial restoration, like the prodigal son. God changes us in baptism, we become adopted members of his family. That's why Romans chapter 8 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship when we cry, Abba, Father. It is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The Roman system says, no, justification is this process that's ongoing and ongoing and ongoing and is related to the finished work of Christ, but the finished work of Christ was not sufficient to complete it without your cooperation or some, I guess, uh, extraterrestrial purging. Well, James, too, uh, is often used by Catholics to indicate that uh, works are a component of salvation, but of course... Uh, James 2 is not talking about justification. The term is never used there. James 2 is simply talking about evidence of salvation. Faith, he says, that you claim is, a, is to be supported by how you live. I mean, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So MacArthur is saying, look, justification is completed by Jesus on the cross. There's nothing we do. It's not a process. We don't cooperate with it. But then what do you do with James chapter 2, which says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, it's true James 2 doesn't have the word justification, but it does have the verb related to it, dikaiotai, or di from dikaiao, to justify, to make righteous. The idea that this is just evidence of saving faith producing works and not the works themselves doing something to increase our justification it doesn't hold up. MacArthur's main argument for this in his previous written works is that James 2.14 is talking about people who have false faith. Some Protestant translations render it this way. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? The idea here is James is talking about people who only say they have faith, 
They actually have false faith or that faith. And so that's why they don't have works and why they aren't justified. It's all about, for James, from this view, you need to have the right faith, not works. MacArthur puts it this way. If someone says, is the phrase that governs the entire the interpretation of the entire passage. But if that's true, the conclusion of justification by faith alone is really tenuous. Because in Greek, the word for faith, hey pistis, you can tra- translate it as that faith, but it literally means the faith or just faith. The King James Bible translates it this way. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? James is not concerned with whether someone has the right kind of faith. He always affirms the concept of faith as being good, even if it's incomplete without the separate concept of works. The Protestant author Scott McKnight says this, No matter how hard we Protestants might try to work this out, the bottom line for James is having works. Um, Jesus in John 8 makes a a great statement. Verse 32, he says, uh, there were some people who believed on him. And he says, if you continue in my word, then you're my real disciple. I mean, if there's been a transformation, there's going to be a manifestation. You know, dogs barks, uh, bark and cats meow and cows moo. In other words, there's a, there's a, there's a natural response to, to who you are. And if I'm a Christian, then I'm going to behave like one because it's my nature. And that's all James is saying. James is just saying, don't claim faith in Christ and then show me a life that doesn't evidence that. Uh, faith without works is dead in the sense that it's non-existent. Uh, because if it's genuine saving faith, it's going to show up in how you live your life. James is not teaching about the importance of having saving faith over what Protestants might call dead, deedless, or inauthentic faith. The phrase saving faith, it's not found in James or the Bible. When James says faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead, he's not saying a dead faith is one that has no works, whereas a living faith is one that does have works. James isn't talking about dead or inauthentic faith. He only talks about faith. My colleague Jimmy Aiken puts it this way. The faith isn't the problem. It's being alone is the problem. In other words, James is not talking about having the right kind of faith. He's talking about having works with our faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But that does not mean that faith automatically produces the works that please God without any cooperation on our part. We have to choose to do that, and that is what James is saying. What is the difference between justification and sanctification? Uh, Justification is an act by which God, at a moment, declares a sinner righteous. Literally, at that moment, that sinner passes from death to life, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear Son. He is commuted as to a sentence to hell, and he is granted eternal glory in heaven. That is an act by which God declares the sinner righteous on the basis of no merit of the sinner, but because Jesus actually paid the penalty for all his sins. His sins then being paid for, God is free to grant him the righteousness of Christ. That's justification. Sanctification starts at that point because certainly the sinner is set apart, which is what sanctified means. He's set apart by that justification from sin. Sanctification starts at that point but continues through all of life a process by which that sinner is increasingly obedient, increasingly shaped into the very image of Christ. Then glorification is the consummation when we lose the unredeemed flesh, when we lose the the sinful nature and are taken into glory. So that salvation comes in three parts, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Uh, Paul talks about all three in Titus 1. He, He says that his ministry was for the faith of God's elect. That's justification, so that the elect can hear the gospel, believe, and be justified. And it was for the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, that's sanctification, and that it was for the hope of glory, that's glorification. So, as has been often said, in justification you're saved from the penalty of sin. In sanctification, from the power of sin, increasingly, as you grow in holiness. In glorification, from the presence of sin. Those are the three clearly defined components that make up the full salvation.
Here, Catholics and Protestants might differ in semantics more than substance. We agree there is a difference between the grace we receive in our initial justification and baptism that we don't merit in any way, and the grace we do merit by cooperating with God's grace to help increase our justification and our sanctification by doing good works. The Catechism puts it this way, Moved by grace, man turns toward God and away from sin, thus accepting forgiveness and righteousness from on high. Justification is not only the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and renewal of the interior man. So what MacArthur makes a sharp distinction between the irrevocable moment of justification and then the process of sanctification, Catholics would speak about a process of justification and a process of sanctification together, though are very clear that while we do not merit the initial graces of salvation, any other graces that are merited, we do that by cooperating with God. We cannot do that on our human merit alone. The Catechism makes this clear in paragraph 2011. The charity of Christ is the source in us of all our merits before God. Grace, by uniting us to Christ in active love, ensures the supernatural quality of our acts and consequently their merit before God and before men. The saints have always had a lively awareness that their merits were pure grace. Rome does preach a false gospel. Uh, There's no question about that because Rome denies the great cardinal doctrine of the gospel, justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It is a false gospel. Therefore, it is a damnable heresy. It It is teaching that prevents people from being saved in the sense that that no one can be saved who believes Roman Catholic theology of the gospel. Uh, A Roman Catholic can be a Christian, but not if he believes Roman Catholic theology of the gospel. MacArthur's argument, it indicts not just Catholics, but any Christian who thinks we cooperate with God's grace, either to begin our salvation or reject salvation or grow in holiness. If MacArthur's really strict that a Christian must believe we are saved by grace alone under his view where we can't cooperate at all, then the only Christians would be five-point Calvinists, which is highly implausible. And there, I'm sure, are some Roman Catholics, Roman Catholic only in the sense that they're in the church, who, um, who don't even know the doctrine of the church. But to say that one uh, believes Roman Catholic theology and, and could be a Christian is, is not true. Uh, over half of our church, our new Christian, maybe uh, if we have 10,000 people, well over 5,000 people in our church would be, would be new Christians. The vast majority of those people are Roman Catholic, ex-Roman Catholics. It's the most fertile soil I've ever found for evangelism. The reason, they already believe in the Trinity. They already believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, the deity of the Holy Spirit. They already believe in the need for salvation. They're already worried about hell and would like to go to heaven. And they're desperate. Many of them are desperate because they cannot find peace. They cannot find God. They do not know Christ, and they know that. They have no victory over sin. They live with fear. They have no hope to know they're saved. And they find their way to the true gospel, and it's tremendously liberating and joyous to them. I think think to say that we need to evangelize Roman Catholics is is very obvious because they need to be saved. Beyond that, I think they are a fertile, fertile ground for effective evangelism. Um, But I think the tragedy of tragedies is to recast them as Christians already in the kingdom. That's a frightening thing. I agree with MacArthur that it's easier for Protestants to evangelize people who share a lot with them like Catholics. It's easier than evangelizing a Muslim or an atheist. That's why it's so important for Catholics to be catechized and to understand the biblical foundations of their faith. And when they do that, they can see it's easy to share the Catholic faith with Protestants who already have a lot in common with us. So it goes both ways here. And to bring them into full communion with Christ's church.
Well, what about Roman Catholic baptismal regeneration? It's just another one of the components that introduces works into salvation. Baptism is a response that the believer makes to salvation. Having been saved, you publicly confess your salvation through the symbolism of baptism, immersion, uh, where you picture in that wonderful ordinance the death, burial, and resurrection that you've enjoyed in Christ spiritually by faith, and you rise to walk in newness of life in the terms of Romans 6. I think baptism follows conversion. It's not a human work that effects conversion or that produces conversion, as Rome and, and others have said. Can a person be saved without being water baptized? A person can be saved, yes, without being water baptized. A person can't be, however, obedient to the Lord at that point without doing it. You could be saved without it. In fact, everybody is saved without it. <laughs> I mean, everybody who's saved is saved without water baptism. Water baptism doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with you being saved. It is an act of obedience, however. I think being baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit is a spiritual reality. It doesn't have anything to do with water baptism. It's, uh, it's, it's Christ literally placing you into his body, the church, the, 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 the mystical church, if you will, the, the church uh, militant, the, the spiritual entity that is the body of Christ. I think it's that divine miracle by which we are joined to the Lord. As 1 Corinthians 6 says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, and all being one spirit in the Lord, we are joined to each other and we share the common faith. I agree that in adult baptism, it doesn't happen until the Holy Spirit gives someone the gift of faith and moves them to desire baptism, provided they accept the gift of faith. But this prompting by the Holy Spirit, it's not what makes us Christians, and it doesn't save us. Baptism is the ordinary means that God gave for us to be saved and become Christians. It doesn't make sense to say, as MacArthur would, that God spiritually regenerates us the moment before we have faith, and so right then we are saved Christians. But then we only become part of the body of Christ later after we're baptized. This would mean that there's some people who are saved, the elect, who are not a part of the body of Christ. It doesn't really make sense. I've talked about baptism a lot on this channel, and I'll probably do some more videos on it in the future. So for now, I just want to highlight that baptismal regeneration, it's not simply a Catholic doctrine. It's something a lot of Protestants believe in, and of course the Eastern Orthodox churches accept. Even Mormons recognize the power of the sacrament of baptism, even though their baptisms are invalid because their concept of God is totally foreign to Christianity. Check out my video on that on this channel. But Mormons at least get that baptism isn't just a symbol. And MacArthur misses the point when he cites Romans 6 because Paul is talking about baptism being the thing that unites us to Christ, not what shows we're already united to him. Here's what Paul writes. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. According to Protestant scholar Douglas Moo, who teaches uh, at Wheaton College, a few scholars have denied any reference to water baptism here, arguing that baptize means immerse in a metaphorical sense or that Paul refers to baptism in the Spirit, or that he uses baptize as a metaphor for incorporation into the body of Christ. But without discounting the possibility of allusions to one or more of these ideas, a reference to water baptism is primary. So after this point in the video, MacArthur basically re-summarizes the arguments he's already made, and since I've already addressed them, I'm not going to go through them again. Uh, but I will say that it is important for Catholics to understand not just their faith, but also different Protestant theologies, uh, because non-Catholic Protestant worldviews can really differ from one another. Uh, John MacArthur is going to differ from Roger Olson, an Arminian theologian, for example. So understanding the differences between Reformed, non-Reformed, Calvinist, non-Calvinist theologies, uh, that's important. And I hope that we'll be able to continue to do that here on this channel and through rebuttals like these. So I hope this is helpful for everybody, and I hope that you will continue to support us at trendhornpodcast.com and that you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trendhornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber.
You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.